All right. Can okay. you hear me well now? Okay. Yes. So uh, this first day of the summer school is dedicated uh, to an in-depth series of lectures on various theoretical aspects of reinforcement learning. And uh, in the last decade, we have witnessed an increase in the popularity of reinforcement learning. Um, so it's uh, by looking at the various statistics across the main machine learning conferences that we can clearly see that reinforcement learning is one of the hottest field uh, in the machine learning com community currently. So this rise of popularity was mainly due to a series of success stories that saw reinforcement learning agents surpassing human level performance across different challenging domains. Unfortunately, there are still many theoretical aspects uh, that uh, remain unclear. And our speakers of today, Niaoe and Bodai, are uh, going to walk us through some of the recent contribution in reinforcement learning, which are fundamental results in the field, as they bring the community some steps ahead in closing this theory practice gap. It is therefore my great pleasure to introduce Niaoe, who is currently assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at ETH Zurich, where she leads the optimization and data intelligence group. Before joining ETH, she received her PhD from Georgia Tech in 2015 under the supervision of Nemirovsky. And then from 2016 to 2020, she had been assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her research lies in the interface of operations research and machine learning with a primary focus on the algorithmic and theoretical foundations of data-driven decision-making problem. We'd like to thank again Professor Niao for joining the summer school and we are really excited to have her as a main speaker. She is going to tell us all about all the new intabular reinforcement learning and reinforcement learning with the nonlinear function approximator. Professor, hey, the floor is yours. Many thanks. All right. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. And again, thank you very much. Also, I want to take the opportunity to thank all the organizers for putting together this very wonderful summer school on data-driven control, which is obviously a very timing topic. And unfortunately, Bo will not be able to join us this morning because it's middle light in California, but he will be joining and giving the two uh, sessions in the afternoon. So today we're going to dive a bit deep into reinforcement learning and uh, review some of the recent advances in reconciling three key aspects of reinforcement learning, namely optimization, generalization, and exploration. And I try to make this uh, uh, lecture as self-contained as possible, just in case some of the students do not have the uh, uh, background in reinforcement learning. But if you have any questions at any moment, uh, feel free to uh, interact or feel free to send your question in the chat or either raise your hand and we'll try to answer those questions. Okay, so let's get started then. Yeah. So I think uh, arguably RL is one of the most important and hottest topic nowadays that lies at the intersection of uh, machine learning and control. And uh, I think there are also many other close terminologies of reinforcement learning that's used in many other communities, like in operations research, we also say this is neuron dynamic programming, or we say this is multi-stage stochastic programming or decision-making under uncertainty. Whereas in control, people may just refer to this as stochastic control or adaptive control. But for this talk, I just stick to the conventions in reinforcement learning and use all the notations there just to be consistent. So what is reinforcement learning? Just to summarize it in one sentence, it basically describes a learning task where an agent tries to learn to act by interacting with the environment. And by interacting the, with the environment, I'm really saying that the environment will be providing some reward signals and feedback of the state after the agent plays certain actions. And by learning to act, I'm really referring to that the agent tries to learn to take the best actions in order to achieve a certain goal or make a good sequential decision, decision along the way. Or, or simply said, he just want to control the system to achieve the goal he has in mind. So in this particular example with this Super Mario game, you can see that the reward are basically the points that he will get and the state or the environment gives the feedback about kind of the screen uh, shot of what are the status looks like. 
And there are essentially four key actions here that he would like to play. And uh, the agent could also be in a, say, a self-driving car where this uh, the goal here would be just to achieve, or to arrive at the, the destination as fast and as safely as possible, right? And an agent could also potentially be just a human. Say, for instance, in this uh, scenario where we wanted to give treatments to patients, a doctor tries to dynamically decide what are the best treatments for patients, given on, on the patient's own uh, health status, and in the long run, tries to improve his well being. So just to summarize, I think that for reinforcement learning, this particular framework or setting is fundamentally different from many other classic settings in control or in other machine learning uh, scenarios like supervised learning. So for instance, first of all, we're dealing with unknown environment, which is online control. Oftentimes we assume that we know the underlying system dynamics. Right. Unlike uh, supervised learning here, we do collect the data on the fly. So the data oftentimes comes from different policies and hence they're non-stationary, unlike the IID settings we often talk about in machine learning. And another very key distinguishing feature about reinforcement learning is that we often receive delayed feedback in the sense that when an agent plays an action, that action does not only affect the intermediate reward he will receive, but will also affect all of the subsequent rewards, right? So this is called the delayed feedbacks. And in certain cases, you will only be able to receive the reward at the very end of the stage of your, your game or your, your problem. And that's often called a sparse reward. And this makes reinforcement learning fundamentally much more challenging than the supervised learning problems. Lastly, uh, it's also obvious that for reinforcement learning, oftentimes it requires this sequential trial and error that you keep trying, the agent keeps trying, connect feedback, and then keeps improving, right? So, so this is also different from other learning scenarios. And I would say that reinforcement learning is obviously not a new topic. It's actually a very old topic that has over 60 years of history. And uh, interestingly, there are actually many recent, uh, I would say, uh, empirical breakthroughs in the in the uh, in the real world that brings RL into the spotlight, and this the, kind of the very uh, well known story goes starts from like uh, uh, playing the Atari game from DeepMind, where they are able to achieve uh, superhuman level performance for many many Atari games within very short period, and and followed by that is the AlphaGo agent or AlphaZero that was able to beat human players within only 70, less than 70 hours of training from scratch. And there are also lots of uh, interesting, exciting stories on beating world champions in all kinds of video games. And recently there was also some, I think in 2019, there are also uh, uh, some other, uh, interesting stories about uh, learning how to play this uh, Rubik cube and that's much more challenging problem. So other than playing games or robot arms, there are actually a lot of other applications of RL in practice. Say for instance, in robotics, of course, this is where reinforcement learning is used the most widely. And there are also other applications. People use this for dynamic treatment in healthcare, for online advertisement and the personalized recommendation in e-commerce, and also using this for energy control. Say for instance, to improving the energy, up building energy uh, efficiency and also data center cooling or control. So there are many interesting and exciting applications in the real world, not just to play in the video games. So there are several fundamental, as I said, grand challenges of the modern reinforcement learning comparing to the classical reinforcement learning that people dealt uh, many years ago. And one of the uh, outstanding issue is the is that in practice, oftentimes we have to deal with very large state space. So if you think about the chess game or the Go games, the number of states can be extremely large. And uh, that means it's 
very in, and and a lot of the algorithms like classical and post learning algorithms often requires to compute and store values for each state and that immediately becomes in, in intractable both in terms of memory cost and also in terms of computation cost and they're also for problems are also uh, like very large action spaces and large search space as you can see here on the right this is kind of the game trees of go and that is that contains like very large amount uh, uh, scenarios of uh, of uh, alternative strategies so besides large state space there is also another key challenge with reinforcement learning is the data insufficiency. And by data insufficiency, they're really, I meant for two aspects. First of all, uh, oftentimes to train such a large scale problems, we need lots of data, but this, but for reinforcement learning problems, unlike uh, uh, in the real world, we don't have unlimited amount of data like in a simulated environment of in, or in some of the control problems. We only have access to very, I would say limited uh, amounts of data, and particularly if you want to deploy your policies, this can be very expensive and costly, right? So the second aspect of data insufficiency is really that oftentimes the data we receive comes from past experiences or some behavior policies, which are not aligned with your ongoing policy or your target policy. So there is also a lack of causal insufficiency there in order to learn those uh, problems well. So those are the two fundamental challenges that brings a lot of uh, 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 new kind of difficulties in three aspects of reinforcement learning. One is how you can optimize it to learn the optimal policy, and also how does it actually generalize to this potentially infinite number of states? And how could we actually explore efficiently in order to uh, learn to solve the problem well? So those are the three fundamental pillars of reinforcement learning that will touch base in this, uh, in this talk throughout. And I should say that a lot of empirical successes in reinforcement learning actually relies heavily on trying to address these three problems, optimization, generalization, and exploration. And there are lots of the recent uh, uh, successful stories in reinforcement learning uh, hinges, hinges on like uh, very new algorithmic advances, or sometimes people call these algorithmic tricks or algorithmic uh, magics. So this includes, of course, for, first and foremost, the, the use of uh, extremely deep neural networks and very complicated neural network architectures to represent your state space or your policies. This also includes, say, for instance, the use of experience replay to memorize and reuse your past experiences in order to make your sample, in order to be more sample efficient. And also the use of, say, for instance, target networks to reduce the overestimation bias and using entropy regularization to uh, facilitate online exploration. And also the use of offline data to, to train your models. So all of those are combined in many of the uh, very advanced reinforcement learning algorithms together in order to achieve good performance. And in this and and in this lecture, we're going to try to unveil some of these mysteries underlying and and try to answer from a theoretical point of view why does some of these uh, tricks work and when doesn't work and and how we can leverage them to build uh, more efficient and robust reinforcement learning algorithms. So that being said, I'll say on the theory side, we really have very little understanding so far, and that leaves a very wide gap of the practice and theory. And this figure may be a little bit exaggerating the, the gap here, but uh, that's how it looks like, I'd say. In practice, as we see that oftentimes we have to deal with very large and infinite state space problems. But in RL theory, at least in the, uh, in the classical theories, oftentimes we are only able to deal with finite state space and uh, oftentimes very small state space. 
And in practice, we oftentimes use very uh, deep neural networks for the function approximation or for representing your, your, your value functions or policies. But in our, most of the existing RL theories, people were only dealing about linear function approximation at best. And in practice, we see that there are so many different tricks, variations, modifications of the RL algorithms. Whereas in theory, I would say most of the uh, theories really focus on more simpler settings and all of the analyses are less adaptive to, to these new variations. And of course, in practice, all of those algorithms that do not really have any theoretical guarantee, although they perform quite well uh, in the real world, but we don't really know that theoretically speaking, will they actually converge even uh, at uh, even even at the basic uh, understanding, and uh, and this basically kind of motivates a very recent active line of work that tries to bridge these two gaps and tries to bring the theory a bit closer to practice by considering all these uh, different aspects. And so, in the goal of this lecture here, sorry, my mouse is getting too fast. So the goal of this lecture series is really trying to provide or establish some theoretical understanding about these algorithmic underpinnings of RL. And uh, particularly we'll be focusing on some interesting new theories that uh, comes from either a control theoretical perspective or some optimization or game theoretic perspectives. And uh, we'll shed, shed light on some uh, interesting results on the both the asymptotics and non-asymptotics of different RL algorithms. And the second component of this uh, lecture series, we really focus on trying to understand uh, the, uh, the more practical RL algorithms from a theoretical viewpoint and try to understand, say, for instance, the convergence, the sample complexity of RL algorithms with nonlinear function approximations with uh, online exploration. And in the end, hopefully also give you some idea of how we can possibly derive new algorithms with both provable guarantees and also sample efficiency. So that is kind of the kind of the goal that we would like to achieve in this lecture, and hopefully you will be able to benefit something from it. And as we go along, so the, the talk will be uh, consisting of uh, four different uh, parts. So the first part, I will mainly focus on the asymptotics of reinforcement learning just to set up the stage so that everybody is on the same page. We will go through some of the basic terminologies, some of the old classical results, and also some of the new findings using those control theoretic tools. And in the second part, we're going to look dive deep into reinforcement learning with nonlinear function approximation and try to understand what are their convergence behaviors and try to see how different ways of designing algorithms that can leverage nonlinear function approximation in a principled manner. And in the third part of this talk, we will be focusing on how we can actually leverage log the data or offline data to train the RL algorithms. And this will also build on this, uh, uh, either the, the, the frameworks that we discuss in from this part two. And in the last part, uh, we will be looking more into reinforcement learning with online exploration and also more on the policy-based methods. So that is the outline of the talk today. And maybe I'll just pause here and to see if there is any question so far at this point. Okay, I think we're good. So there was one question here, and let me just try to see it. So are the training times reported for the examples at the beginning of the talk, slide six, I believe, real training time? Do they refer to sped up simulations? So let's go back to A86.
Okay, here. So those are, I would say, say for instance, uh, uh, for AlphaGo, there are many different improvements of the reinforcement learning algorithms. I think the latest one is Alpha Zero. So the reported the time, say for instance, the agent can achieve uh, uh, a super human level performance within 70 hours is indeed uh, the reported time for the training time actually, yes. What would approximately be the resulting training time if the training were carried out in the real time? So uh, I don't quite follow the question though. So, so all the training are done offline. So they're uh, not necessarily like uh, real time training together with the agent, if I understand that question correctly. So, but I guess the point here is really that uh, I think a lot of these, uh, uh, the efficiency of the training really benefits a lot on the fundamental design of the reinforcement learning algorithms and also the neural network structures. And, and of course, on top of it, there is also the improvement of the uh, computing infrastructures that helps to advance it. But I'd say most of that is because of leveraging more sample efficient reinforcement learning to speed up the, 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 the computation. I hope that answers the question, but we can talk more maybe later on about this point. But as I said, this talk will focus more on kind of the theoretical aspects and the mathematical foundations of reinforcement learning algorithms and try to understand the behaviors of them. Okay, thanks for the question. So maybe let's just uh, move on to the part one of the talk. So just to make sure everyone's on the same page, maybe I'll just uh, go through some of the very basics of reinforcement learning. So, in, so mathematically speaking, reinforcement learning is often described through Markov, Markov decision processes. And here throughout this talk, I'm going to focus purely on discounted infinite horizon setting. And uh, many of these theories can be generalized to the uh, finite horizon settings as well. So we're talking about a Markov uh, decision processes that consist of, uh, I'd say six key uh, components. First of all, the state space. Here for some of this talk, we'll be just looking at finite set. In some part of the talk, we'll be looking at infinite set as well. And the actions uh, space A, uh, the probability transition matrix, which is a probability for uh, the state, uh, the say for instance, the probability when you're giving a state and action, how it will transit to the next state, we're going to denote this as P. And this is probability transition matrix is oftentimes unknown in the reinforcement learning setting. And we're going to denote the reward as R and uh, using mu to denote the initial distribution. And uh, we're going to consider the discounted infinite horizon setting. So we will be using this discount factor gamma that is going to be in between zero and one. Okay, sorry, my pen doesn't work. So, and we define the policy pi to be a mapping from the state S to a uh, to the action space. And this policy could either be deterministic policy or a stochastic policy. So say for instance, in this particular humanoid example, right? Uh, it's just to see that you start with some initial state S0 and you take some action A0. And this action in this case could be like the forces you applied to your fees and loins. And you were, the agent was then immediately receive some reward R0 based on the state and the action he has. And this will also lead to a, another new state S. And if you take another action, this will gives you another immediate reward R1 and it will lead you to another state. 
right? So, so the state here basically encodes, say for instance, the vertical speed, the positions of joints of the agents, or the, the velocity, right, of those. And the eventual goal here is really for the agent to, to try to walk as fast and as steady as possible. And the agent is basically rewarded if he can achieve those goals. So that is kind of the, the very fundamental setting of uh, Markov decision processes. And I'm sorry for the kind of the delay on this. Somehow my computer got stuck and there was quite some delay on my side as well. Let's see if this will work out. So there are two fundamental tasks that are so associated with Markov decision processes. First of all, the uh, the two tasks are first, the first one is policy evaluation. So basically for a given policy pi, we want to evaluate what is the long-term reward you will be able to receive for any given state, starting with any given state S. So that is normally what we denote as W of pi. And uh, uh, there is also, we can also, and this is normally what we call the value function We can also define the values, uh, the, the state action value function, which we denote as Q of pi. And that is basically the long-term reward you will be receiving if you start with the state S and take action A. So another task in reinforcement learning is the so-called uh, policy optimization. Basically you want to find the optimal policy. And we're going to denote V star as the optimal value function. That is the maximum, uh, that, that basically takes the maximum over all of the feasible policies pi. And we're going to denote a Q star as the optimal state action value function. So one kind of fundamental result in reinforcement learning is that both of these two tasks can be equivalent to solving Bellman equations, particularly if you look at the state value function, this is satisfies the so-called Bellman expectation equation. So can everyone still hear me okay? Because I don't know what's going on, but uh, my computer yes. is not to uh, working well and uh, there was this serious delay on my side. So you can see my mouse uh, pointer or is there a delay on your side? Um, we can hear you and see your mouse pointer correctly actually. Okay, um, good. Yes. All right, thank you, yeah. So we can, we can show that uh, the value function actually satisfies the so-called Bellman expectation equation. And this uh, is, can be immediately derived based on the uh, Markov terms. Uh, and particularly, so this basically says that your, your value at a given state S, uh, your long-term value at a given state S is, uh, uh, is essentially the in immediate reward you will get plus the expected reward you will get starting from the next state S prime, right? So this is easy to see. And uh, for the optimal value functions, one can also show a similar result that they are essentially solutions to this Bellman optimality equation. And in the Bellman optimality equation, instead of taking the expectations or the average of your reward here, we're taking the maximal, maximal value or maximal, uh, taking the maximum over all possible actions here. So that is kind of the main difference here. And I should say that many of the classical reinforcement learning algorithms like uh, temporal difference, Q learning algorithms that we were going to introduce are essentially based on solving these Bellman equations. And particularly, maybe let's just dive a bit deep into this Bellman optimality equation. And we're going to define this Bellman optimality operator T that we'll be also using later in this talk, which is uh, uh, defined basically as the reward R plus gamma times this uh, max operator taking expectation, conditional expectation here. 
And as you can see that basically what we showed earlier is, is trying to say that if Q star is the optimal value function, then it is indeed a fixed point of this Bellman optimality operator. And uh, in fact, this is also true vice versa. This is a if and only if uh, condition here. And uh, this is actually a very fundamental result, but uh, maybe we can just, but it can be actually proved very easily. So maybe we just uh, see kind of why this is indeed a sufficient condition. So suppose we have a, uh, I think I missed a very important point in the previous slide that, so the reason why we oftentimes use this uh, state action value functions instead of the value functions itself is really because that you can directly derive what is optimal policy pi star based on this state action value function, Q star by just taking the greedy policy according to it. And here basically it's, let's say that if Q star is indeed a fixed point to the Bellman optimality operator, then that implies Q star is indeed the optimal value function. So to see this, let's just look at the difference between Q star and any given policy, any for the value function for any given policy pi, right? So if we look at the difference between Q star and Q pi, so based on the uh, Bellman expectation uh, uh, equality uh, equations, we know that Q pi satisfies this Bellman equation here. And uh, this basically implies that Q pi is going to be the inverse of this matrix times your reward vector R, right? This, fun this matrix is indeed invertible uh, because it actually you can show that this is a full rank matrix. And uh, uh, you can also use the Bellman optimality equation to show this relationship of Q star and, uh, and your reward R. And you can also do the same thing by replacing this R. Basically, this R is going to be, let me try to do this one. Maybe, uh, uh, so you can easily show this from this, just by plugging the definition of Q star and Q pi here. And you will be able to see that uh, the difference of Q star and Q pi is going to be this uh, inverse of this matrix here times the difference between the transition matrices P and P uh, at pi star and pi. And the first term is uh, uh, non-negative indeed, and which you can easily show. And uh, because, those, uh, because of this uh, uh, P are indeed uh, non-negative everywhere and this gamma is between zero and one. And second term, it also this is also non-negative because uh, the definition of how you choose pi star, which is a greedy policy corresponding to Q, Q star. So P times Q star is indeed the maximum value function, maximum over Q star, right? So that is, is larger than just taking any other arbitrary policy pi. So with this, you can basically show that, okay, Q star is indeed the optimal value function. And the other side of this, uh, uh, Result can be easily derived also by just plugging the definition of Q star, which I will not show here. And for the interest of time, so uh, let me just maybe speed up a bit. So we can also define, uh, we can also show that this Bellman optimality operator is indeed a contraction mapping. And uh, that is also something you can see immediately by plugging this definition of uh, T of Q here. And indeed it is a contraction in terms of L infinity norm. And based on this result, as you can see that you have a, uh, you really were trying to find a fixed point of this, uh, of this equation, of this Bellman operator. And a natural way of solving this uh, Bellman equation would be just to apply the fixed point iteration, right? Particularly uh, if we know what is underlying dynamics, we know the MDP and, and this is a, uh, then we can exactly compute what is the Bellman operator and, uh, and we can do this iteratively by applying the Bellman operator to a value function QT. And this is called the value iteration, right? And as you can see, this is nothing but just a fixed point iteration. So you, based on the contraction property of this Bellman operator, you can immediately show that this value iteration actually converges linearly. 
So another different way of uh, solving the Velma equation is to do this fixed point iteration on the policy instead of on the uh, value functions. So the idea is basically you can uh, try to compute, uh, improve your policy at every iteration by computing this uh, greedy policy with respect to your current Q functions. So this, I wrote it in one line here, but this indeed requires two steps, right? The first step is first of all, for a given policy pi, you want to evaluate what is this state action, uh, state action value function Q. And then the second step is that you can try to improve it but from the current policy to a new policy pi t plus one by just taking the maximum actions. And in fact, you can show that this also converges linearly. So, so both value iteration and policy iteration, if you know, if you can compute the uh, uh, Bellman operator, they converge uh, linearly. And there is a difference, of course, in terms of the per iteration complexity because policy iteration requires both evaluation step and this policy improvement step. And in practice, this is oftentimes much faster than the value iteration. But coming back to our reinforcement learning problem, we know that We know that oftentimes we do not really know the underlying dynamics. We don't know this uh, matrix P. Instead, what we have is just a sequence of samples that either coming from some target policy pile, which we call, or from some behavior policy. And, and we cannot really just uh, compute those Bellman optimality operators because the state uh, uh, and cannot really uh, compute to store or in memory all of those value functions at every state and action because the state and action space can be very large, right? So, in, so as a remedy, I think in, uh, in order to, uh, to deal with unknown uh, transition probabilities, oftentimes people have to resort to this bootstrapping or so-called or stochastic approximation schemes. And this include many typical examples like TD learning, standard co-learning. And to deal with large state and action spaces, we have to resort to some function approximation techniques to represent your, your, your value functions instead. And this could be linear function approximation or using deep neural networks. So for instance, for a given state, we can just uh, uh, represent our value function as a, a linear function in terms of a number of uh, basic uh, feature vectors phi. Or we can also just use a neural networks to represent our value functions instead. And in the end, instead of learning these value functions for every state, we're only going to just learn the parameter theta. And this parameter theta is often in a much lower dimensional space where this D here is much less than the, the state space. So now this, I'm going to just uh, quickly discuss some several uh, fundamental algorithms that we can use for this policy evaluation or to find optimal policy. So the first one is temporal difference learning that is uh, the one of the most widely used uh, approach for policy evaluation. So for a given policy pi, you want to estimate what is the value function. So the idea is that at every iteration, you're going to just uh, use your uh, next state to estimate the target uh, value of your uh, value function. And then you're going to consider or take this uh, combination or convex combination between your target estimate here. Sorry that uh, this is not transitioning well. So we're going to, uh, so the way how this TD learning works is, is basically you try to first compute this uh, 
target update. And then you take the difference between the target update and your current value of uh, function at SK. And this is what's so-called temporal difference. And then you do this iteratively. So this is in the tabular setting. In the func linear function approximation setting, you basically just update your uh, parameters theta accordingly. So this, again, this uh, orange part is the temporal difference. And this phi here is the uh, feature vector. So you can also extend this to more general nonlinear function approximation. Say for instance, here we consider this uh, particular two layer neural network where you have this uh, uh, only one hidden layer and uh, you have this weight matrix W like for any given uh, state, you feed it into this uh, first input layer, which is going to be just those, uh, uh, the feature, make feature vectors you have. And then you will get this uh, kind of uh, two layer neural network representation. And you can also, come up with this uh, TD learning algorithm. So here, instead of uh, here, you can see that uh, have this uh, temporal difference term times the gradient of your value function at uh, W. Here, I'm just fixing B. So B is not a parameter here. So maybe I'll just pause here and see if there is any question. Exactly, sorry to interrupt. Uh, there are a few questions. So if the, the students, if they um, feel comfortable, please, please unmute, it's okay. You can ask the speaker directly. If you don't feel comfortable, we can do it for you. But please, if you uh, want to ask a question, go ahead. Yeah, I feel comfortable, but I think there are some people before me. Uh, That's okay, you can go ahead. And then all right, we'll... yeah. Uh, Thank you for the presentation. And I wanted to ask you uh, if we can make any convexity assumptions since we are computing some maximization operators. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we actually compute them? Is, is, uh, is the thing that we are optimizing actually convex? So that's a good question. So first of all, the uh, max operator is uh, taking over uh, if we were talking about the uh, Bellman optimality operator, then say normally, say for instance, the max is taking over the action space, right? So if your action space is finite, then you can actually easily compute it, right? If it's finite state or uh, finite action space, then that does not really involve any solving any nonlinear optimization at all. Because you were just uh, saying, say for instance, uh, if you, the action space only has four actions, Right, you were just basically trying to uh, compute which ones gives you the largest uh, value, and that uh, basically can be done in linear time, all of linear time. Right, so that by itself is not an optimization problem, but we will come back more on how that will. Uh, and well, of course, like if you have a infinite uh, action space, then of course that will become a actual optimization problem or at least a learning optimization problem. And then you need to consider about convexity or non-convexity there. But so far, I think uh, here we will be mostly focusing on uh, finite action space where you can evaluate what is the maximum uh, over then. That was very clear. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So there were Hi, a few uh, other questions. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Yeah. Shall I go ahead? Absolutely. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you mentioned that uh, the matrix I minus, well, like identity minus gamma times P is invertible, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, is is that due to the fact that the P matrix is stochastic matrix and the rows add up to one? Yes, so it's, it's due to, first of all, the gamma, uh, the discount factor is between zero and one, and then P is the stochastic matrix. And then you can show that uh, for any like long zero vector, if you like multiply this matrix by this uh, vector, 
right and it won't always be it will never be zero right if you take the norm of i, I cannot really write here but uh, right but right it, yeah but this yes as you said this depends on this gamma being zero and one and keeping the stochastic matrix yes mm -hmm. okay thank you so much Um, I have a small question about the derivative that you have at the bottom of slide 19, if that's okay. Yes, sure. Um, so uh, so um, forgive if this is a, a bit of a naive question, but so at the bottom of slide 19, yes, uh, you, have a, you have a gradient there. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, what is the configuration space over which the this derivative is computed? So this gradient in particular. So, uh, uh, so right outside these square brackets here? Right, yes. There is this gradient at W, right? And yes. this, for this particular next uh, neural net uh, work, you can actually compute this gradient here, right? With respect to W, right? The gradient is basically going to be, so this sigma is the activation function. Say for instance, this could be a sigmoid or this could be the rectified linear unit. Ah, oh, okay. Okay. So you can actually say, for instance, you can actually compute this, right? So this will be, say, for instance, for rectified linear unit or for just any activation function, this is just going to be the, uh, the gradient of this uh, times phi, right? So this is something you can actually compute, yeah. Thank you.